Welcome to Big Tent Live Events, the live online event series from the University of Oxford as part of the Humanities Cultural Programme. My name is Philip Bullock and I'm Director of TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre in Humanities and Professor of Russian Literature and Music here at the University of Oxford. The Big Tent Live Event Series brings together researchers, students and practitioners from across different disciplines. Together, we'll explore important subjects and ask questions about topics such as the environment, medical humanities, AI, technology, the history of disease, but we'll also celebrate storytelling, music, song and identity. We're bringing you this event series online whilst we're all physically distanced and we hope that you are all safe and well during these difficult times. We look forward to seeing you all again soon in person as soon as we're able to or to welcoming you at future events as part of the Humanities Cultural Programme. Everyone is welcome in our big tent and we thank you, our viewers, for your ongoing support and engagement. We thank too all the participants who have given their time, their words and their big ideas as we come together online. This series would not be possible, of course, without the support from so many people behind the scenes, including the Torch team. So thank you so much. If you would like to put forward any questions to our speakers during the event tonight, please pop them in the comments box on YouTube and we will answer as many as possible during the Q&A at the end of the session. So now on to our excellent speakers tonight. It's an honour to host them and to welcome them. Abby Williams and Giles Lewin for this event, The Social Life of Books, A History of Reading Together at Home. Abby Williams is Professor of 18th Century Literature at St. Peter's College, University of Oxford. A monograph on reading aloud, The Social Life of Books, was published by Yale in, 19, in 2017. She's currently working on a book on the history of misreading. Lewin is a performer and composer, primarily a violinist specialising in medieval music and the traditional music of Europe and the Middle East. Giles has written and performed music for theatre and radio, and played on many film and television scores. He is a founder member of the folk band Bellowhead and the early music groups, the Dufay Consort, Alva, and the Carnival Band. Tonight, Abby will give us a glimpse of an 18th century world of domestic culture, and will be joined in some performances by Giles, and together they'll share their thoughts on the revival of this culture in the current climate. So Abby and Giles, thank you for joining us this evening. Over to you. to an evening at home in the 18th century, coming to you live from a 60s semi in suburban Oxford. I'm going to be talking about being at home together, but I want to start by taking us outside for a little while. I'm going to start with a diary entry from another April day over 200 years ago, from the 15th of April, 1802. On that day, Dorothy Wordsworth and her brother William Wordsworth took one of the most significant walks in literary history. They set out in blustery weather, a day maybe a bit like today, walking across the fells near Oldswater in the Lake District. Dorothy tells us that it was misty and mild with a strong wind, and the first, just very first signs of spring were emerging in the hedgerows. There were a few daffodils here and there, and then they came upon, upon what she describes as a whole belt of them. This is, how, this is how her diary entry reads. I never saw daffodils so beautiful, they grew among the mossy stones, about and about them. Some rested their heads upon these stones, as on a pillow for weariness, and the rest tossed and reeled and danced, and seemed as if they verily laughed with the wind that blew upon them over the lake. They looked so gay, ever glancing, ever changing. The diary entry doesn't stop there. She 
continues to talk about the way in which they carried on with their walk, they endured the wild weather, and they found refuge in a tavern. They had a really hearty meal of ham and potatoes. And then she says, after supper, William was sitting by a bright fire when I came downstairs. He soon made his way to the library, piled up in a corner of the window. He brought out a volume of Enfield's Speaker, another miscellany, and an odd volume of Congreve's plays. We had a glass of warm water and rum. We enjoyed ourselves and wished for Mary. So you've got this day in which she talks about going with her brother on a walk. They both see this amazing spectacle of the daffodils together. Then they go to a pub. They enjoy themselves by taking random books off the shelves, drinking rum and water and thinking about their friend Mary. That diary entry is, has become famous in large part because it provided the basis for a much more celebrated literary representation of that day, which is Wordsworth's, William Wordsworth's poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. And I think the comparison between them is really interesting. I'm just gonna remind you how that poem goes by reading out a couple of stanzas. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. He continues later on, for oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. And what you've got there is two very different versions of what that day looked like. In Dorothy's account, it's about a shared experience the literary experience of that day is to do with pulling off the books from the shelves and reading them out loud. She's not that fussed about what they are, it's the fact that they're doing it together. And in William Wordsworth's account, it's all about being alone looking at the daffodils and what that then means to him when he reflects on it by himself, the way it prompts the imagination. I think that it's quite telling that um, the more celebrated of those representations has come to condition the ways in which many of us think about literature and what it does for us, that it's a thing about individual expression, it's often about isolation, perhaps a form of solipsism, and that, that it enables more to, us more to reflect upon ourselves. The model that we've got in Dorothy's account is about togetherness and about reading as a way of linking people. So I wrote a book which was about the history of reading aloud, the, the history of books in homes in the 18th century, and um, I did quite a lot of archival research to do that. And when I wrote that book, I, it seemed to me something which was worth digging out historically, but not something which had an awful lot of contemporary resonance. And now I find, of course, in the last couple of months that it's come to be a much more familiar world than I ever expected it to be. At this time when many of us are confined to our homes and are reading more, spending more time with family, thinking about ways of filling the time at home with homemade culture, returning to reading together as a social practice, it's got a new kind of relevance. So what I'm gonna talk about today is some of the ways in which thinking again about the domestic world of reading offers us the chance to think about some of the ways in which reading has knotted us and knitted us together in the past. And also some of the other ideas or the other issues that it speaks to. So what I found in thinking about reading in the 18th century is that reading is linked to lots of other things. It's linked to anxieties about how to behave, anxieties about what your home looked like, about uh, social aspiration, about being seen to do the right thing, about what to do in times of idleness, and, about, and worries about the potentially immersive, distracting effects of fiction. So how did people think about reading in the 18th century? Part of the whole deal with thinking about reading or practicing reading together in the 18th century was linked to middle class aspiration, a rising middling class, to worries about being idle and not being able to use your time productively and in showing that you're a good and virtuous person. One of the things about reading out aloud was it enabled you other people to do productive things while it was happening. So it wasn't a moment of, moment of idleness, it enabled productivity and also enabled the consumption of stuff which was kind of morally or educationally improving. So it was about virtue and about display. The writer James Fordyce describes um, an ideal woman he knows of, uh, so in an instruction book telling how young women how to behave, he describes this really, this exemplar 
and the way in which she uses reading in her social circle. He says that this woman never sat idle in company, being a perfect mistress of her needle and having an excellent taste in that, as in many other things, her manner, whether at home or abroad, was to be constantly engaged in working something useful or beautiful. For the sake of variety and improvement, when in her own house, some one of, her, one of the company would often read aloud while she and her female visitants were thus employed. So that's pulling together lots of those ideas about not being idle, about making beautiful or useful things, engaging in rational conversation and enlarging your mind. So there's all that kind of virtuous engagement and activity going on. And this is all happening in spaces which are getting fuller and fuller of things. So one of the other things that's happening as part of this rise of the middling sort is a big consumer culture where people are buying uh, newly imported wallpapers and china and lacquerware and they are kitting out their houses with this splendor and then inviting their friends around to come and look at it. So this is the era in which formal visiting takes off. You might stack out your diary on a daily basis with lots and lots of different groups of people coming around to visit you, enacting the kind of sociability that was seen as being so important. So that was uh, partly a culture of sociability, but it's also partly really about nosiness. The author of a book called The Lady's Companion said that these kind of social, these kind of social formal visits were often nothing more than inspections. Many go to see those for whom they are perfectly indifferent, whether they find them alive or dead, well or sick. Such visits are but insidious instructions of a spy rather than the good office of a neighbour. And this, it makes me, it makes me think of one of the high points of, uh, if there are any, of doing endless Zoom meetings is that you get to check out other people's backgrounds to their houses where they're working in their offices and their bedrooms or their spare rooms. You get to have a good look at what they've got on their walls or how messy they are or what their sofa's like. And I think there's that same kind of, uh, we are suddenly afforded that same possibility of inspecting other people's houses in a quite intimate way in, these new, in this new situation of lockdown. The Museum of um, the Museum of the Home in East London is running a brilliant digital collecting project at the moment called the Stay Home Collecting Project, asking people to send in images of their homes during lockdown, but real images, not ones where they specially tied it up, but they're finding it really difficult to get people to send in actual pictures of rooms with socks on the floor or washing drying on the radiator, because all of us have this urge to kind of make a better version of our lives for public consumption. So given that part of the game of visiting in the 18th century was to examine how other people lived, those same principles of aspirational display also apply to the ways in which people behave themselves in those newly decorated rooms. You could get advice books telling you on how to prepare for a visit at somebody else's house. A, a work called The Lady's Preceptor tells its readers to not fall into the trap of caressing the first dog that comes to their relief. And it gives them instructions on how to sparkle in company. So this is how to sparkle. If the occasion of the visit does not afford you a subject for conversation, take care not to be so unprovided with one as to be obliged to the weather or the hour of the day for your discourse. It is not at all amiss to consider beforehand what topics are suitable to the company you're going to see. And in keeping with this idea that you've got to show your best version of uh, yourself to the world, if you are engaging in any social visiting or activity. This was parod parodied in contemporary literature. So in Richard Sheridan's play, The Rivals, there's a woman called Lydia Languish, who's completely addicted to reading romantic fiction, but trying to disguise that from her family who disapprove of it. Uh, and so what she does is that she has to rapidly cover up all the evidence of her, the true nature of her reading material when her family is about to enter the room. Here, my dear Lucy, hide these books. Quick, 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 quick. Fling per Peregrine Pickle under the toilet. Throw Roderick Random into the closet. Put the innocent adultery into the whole duty of man, which was a really worthy book. Thrust Lord Aimworth under the sofa. Leave Fordyce's sermons open on the table. So you've got this big mismatch between what you show you're doing and what you're actually doing, which makes me think of people curating those shelfies of their, the books that they've got. A colleague of mine has got a joke in staff meetings where he tries to arrange the most, now that they're online, the most pretentious series of books behind his head so as to intimidate his colleagues. So I've been describing this world of aspiration and performance and display, but an evening at home in the 18th century was very much a mixed evening. There would be 
read bits of reading aloud. Uh, as we've said, seen, there'll be people who are sewing. Um, there would also be music. And before you get the impression that all of this was a very kind of prim and prudish um, display of uh, propriety, I think it's important to remember there was a lot of kind of smutty fun that was part of that as well. And so now I am going to call on my assistant to give us an example of a riddle from an 18th century collection of jests, which was a really popular form of reading in the 18th century kind of joke books, which had well, uh, riddles and enigmas in them. So Giles, give us an 18th century riddle. What's that in which good housewives take delight, which though it has no legs will stand upright? Tis often used, both sexes must agree, beneath the navel, yet above the meat. At the end, it has a hole. Tis stiff and strong, thick as a maiden's wrist, and pretty long. To a soft place, tis very oft applied, and makes the thing tis used to still more wide. The women love to riddle it to and fro, that what lies under may the wider grow. By giddy sluts, sometimes it is abused, but by good housewives rubbed before it is used, that it may fitter for their purpose be, when they to occupy the same are free. Now tell me, merry ladies, if you can, what this must be, that is no part of the man. Thank you. So, uh, answers on a virtual postcard, uh, which uh, you can do by, if you think you know the answer to that riddle, then you can pop it in the comments, um, in the YouTube comments. But this is my special advice on how to interpret an 18th century riddle. They're all about innuendo. And the smuttier the riddle sounds, the uh, more innocent this meaning often is. And now Giles is going to play us a little bit of a piece of music to create that mixed evening of entertainment. <laughs> taken by Vaughan Williams, who was in fact plundered from uh, one of the early English collections of uh, dance music called The English Dancing Master, published by John Playford. Uh, and the original tune was called The 29th of May. And um, what Vaughan Williams was doing um, in the 20th century was very much what the 18th century publishers were doing then. They were taking um, tunes from other places, theatre tunes, ballad tunes, Scottish tunes, anything that they thought would be popular and um, turning them into dances for their publications and for people to dance to um, in their houses and, uh, and on galleries of the larger houses. Um, the first tune I played was a, a tune called The Running Footman. Um, so over to you over there. Okay, thank you. So back to books. Here we all are then, reading away in lockdown. In a survey which was commissioned for World Book Night last Thursday, um, um, the groups of people who were surveyed uh, revealed that 31% of them were reading more since lockdown began. What's interesting, I think, about some of that research is that it seems to suggest that people were read are reading more fiction than non-fiction. So adult non-fiction has gone down by 13%. And it looks like readers are finding, at the moment, are finding solace in imaginary worlds. One of the people they interviewed said, talked about the fiction she was reading and said, it takes me to another better place and allows me to escape the current situation for a while. And it feels like for many people, they would rather lose themselves in a fictional space 
someone which is very distinctly different from the present moment as a way of coping with what's going on. To us, that at this moment in the 21st century, that all seems quite wholesome. The idea of losing yourself in a novel is a really good thing. You go on a voyage with your mind and it takes you out, um, out of where you are. We don't think of that as a negative thing. But in the 18th century, that was seen as a really worrying development. That was seen as something to be really suspicious of. In the 18th century, the novel was a relatively new phenomenon and people were pretty unsure about what the effects it might have on you morally and cognitively if you immersed yourself in fiction for that long, that you might get muddled up about what was fiction and what was true life. And the people who were seen as particularly vulnerable in terms of creating that muddle and getting kind of distracted and rather and kind of obsessed with fictional worlds were women and young people. And there's this kind of hysterical commentary on how terrible it is that women, women will be on their own reading fiction. Um, and that was seen as kind of um, almost erotically tempting for them. So here's uh, one conduct writer describing what happened, what would happen if uh, with the prevalence of all of these novels. Every corner of the kingdom is abundantly supplied with them. In vain is youth secluded from the corruptions of the living world. Books are commonly allowed them with little restriction as innocent amusements. Yet these often pollute the heart in the recesses of the closet inflame the passions at a distance from temptation and teach all the malignity of vice in solitude. Another conduct writer describes the way in which girls' virtue got steadily corrupted. The appetite becomes too keen to be denied and in proportion as it is more urgent grows less nice and select in its fare. What would formerly have given offence now gives none. The palate is vitiated or made dull. The produce of the book club and the contents of the circulating library are devoured with indiscriminate and insatiable avidity. Actually, the evidence of uh, contemporary library borrowing records and book sales from the mid 18th century shows that the people who are most likely to be buying novels were in fact middle-aged men. But there's a total mismatch between the kind of uh, moral hysteria over women and young people reading fiction and the, the actual likelihood of the, them consuming them. I think one of the reasons for that was because uh, women and young people were seen as not very good at distancing themselves from um, the fictional worlds that they encountered and so much more likely to muddle them up. And so this creates a particular role for reading together in the family because it enabled a kind of shared and more controlled exposure to fiction than the idea of people scurrying off up to their rooms to do it on their own, on their beds. Um, it was a little bit like a kind of moral prophylactic in a way, this reading together in a family, because you got to shape not only what was read, but how it was read, how it was read. And I think all of this reminds me of our anxiety about our, what our kids, are do, teenage kids are doing in their rooms with gaming and screens. And we also are anxious about people going off into private spaces and becoming immersed in fantasy worlds that they will struggle to emerge from in their heads. That, and we feel that's dangerous in a way that we can't necessarily quantify or explain. And that seems really parallel with the ways in which fiction, prose fiction and the novel was viewed in the 18th century. So um, I've written this book about reading out aloud. And one of the things that it really made me think about was the role of orality in thinking about books and literature. I think that we don't often imagine that the ways in which readers judge books or have judged books is how easy they are to read out aloud. There's a great quote from Elizabeth Hamilton, a young woman who is growing up in a gentry family in Stirlingshire in the second half of the 18th century. And she said that the best prose style was that which could be longest read without exhausting the breath. And it's totally true that how long a sentence is completely conditions your pleasure of being able to read it out aloud. At the moment, I am most days doing a little reading on FaceTime of chapters for a book of a book to a little boy who's living in London. And I really notice as I do it every day that it matters not only how long the sentences are, but when there are too many consonants and I trip up in the way that I'm reading. And I also really mind about how long the chapters are. I want them to be the same length because then I know how many I can do in the amount of time I've got available. Those aren't questions that ever really fit, uh, figure in his jubilatory criticism, but they're clearly are affected by the idea of reading out aloud. So, reading out aloud, this uh, the 18th century is often called the great age of elocution because 
one of the um, consequences of this uh, rise of the middling sort and of rising affluence is that more uh, there's rising literacy. So more and more people are able to read. And because more and more people are able to read, it becomes more and more important to be able to read well, to distinguish yourself from all the other people who read in a really ordinary way. So you could buy books that taught you how to read aloud and you could hire a tutor, you could go to a lecture to see how it was done, you could go to a spouting club, which was where you would learn to read out plays in a really dramatic manner. And I thought that what we should do to finish this little talk is to see what reading aloud in the 18th century actually looked and sounded like. So I am going to do a masterclass in 18th century reading aloud with my willing pupil here. And what we're going to do is to take a book which was called The Reader or a Citer, which gives you little passages of prose. And within the prose, there are instructions in italics which tell you how you've got to do it in a really, really specific way. So it's total handholding for the would-be uh, elocutionary student. So we've got this passage from The Reader or a Citer, which is an Eastern story from The Rambler, from Samuel Johnson's The Rambler. And I'm going to instruct Giles here, if you're willing, uh, mm -hmm. in how to read it out aloud, 18th century style. So Giles, an Eastern story. Obida, the son of Abensina, left the caravansera early in the morning and pursued his journey through the plains of Indistan. Mm -mm. Be now a little warm and animated in your expression. He was fresh and vigorous with rest. He was animated with hope. He was incited by desire. Now, look as if you were viewing the scene described. He walked swiftly over the valleys and saw the hills gradually rising before him. You must glow with the writer in your expression as you proceed with this enchanting description. As he passed along, his ears were delighted with the morning song of the bird of paradise. He was fanned by the last flutters of the sinking breeze and sprinkled with dew by groves of spices. Let your tone be now more powerful hmm? in order to create a contrast that follows of great beauty. Mark particularly the word towering. He sometimes contemplated the towering height of oak, monarch of the hills. Here comes the contrast alluded to. Be peculiarly soft and gentle in your voice to the end of the colon. And sometimes caught the gentle fragrance of the primrose, eldest daughter of the spring. Conclude the sentence with a glow of satisfaction. All his senses were gratified and all care was banished from his heart. Thus he went on till the sun approached his meridian and the increasing heat preyed upon his strength. He then looked round about him for some more commodious path. He saw in his right hand a grove that seemed to wave its shades as a sign of invitation. He entered it and found the coolness and verdure irresistibly pleasant. <laughs> In descriptions, be equally descriptive in your manner of reading them. So when you mention the sun as above, cast your eyes upward and give a look as if you discovered the grove. When you read, he saw in his right hand a grove, etc. Your forefinger pointed at the same time, yeah, will produce a good effect. Thus he went on till the sun approached his meridian and the increasing heat preyed upon his strength. He then looked round for some far more commodious path. He saw on his right hand a grove that seemed to wave its shades as a sign of invitation. He entered it and found the coolness and verdure irresistibly pleasant. Brilliant, brilliant. Not at all, Hammy, right? <laughs> so I think that you can see there that although people in the 18th century said oh it's really important not to be too um actually when you read out aloud be supernatural well they didn't say supernatural they said be very natural in fact it was pretty stagey judging by those instructions so i think um i guess the lesson for us all to learn is you need to learn to glow with the writer as you read out your books at home 
And you probably all need to learn to raise your game a bit in terms of the pointing and uh, general hand gestures. And with that, that seems a really good moment for us to uh, see if there's any questions, if anyone wants to and wants to ask about any of the things that we've been talking about. And I think Philip is going to help us there to uh, see what people might have to say about it. Philip, you there? I'm having a cup of tea in the next room. Hmm. I'm not quite sure where Philip is at the moment. Do you know any good 18th century jokes? Um. I'm sure we read some more riddles. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. Apologies for that. I was having some technical difficulties and then a great moral quandary of where to relocate myself in a way that wouldn't reveal my terrible interior decor. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm, I'm back and bear with me whilst we just sort of try and get things on the way here. But we've been getting terrific questions in. One which just came in, which was, uh, what about a guide to gestures and the appropriate uh, physical expression of the of the words and you were simultaneously answering that uh, as as you talk so thank you for that terrific uh, demonstration and also this uh, historical look back but with clear but uh, extraordinary contemporary resonances resonances one cheeky quick question which has come in from one of the viewers is where do you get your wallpaper from <laughs> yeah, i knew that would do it <laughs> we're getting commission um is it called uh Cole and Sons, that's what it's called. Yeah. yeah. Some Italian. Design. Yeah, it's Fornacetti, I think, that uh <laughs> sun design. And it's called Okay, well uh, in the spirit of kind of commercial uh, non-compromise, we should say that other wallpaper brands are also available. <laughs> so, so but yeah, thank you. I'm sure one viewer is very, very pleased there with that. <laughs> um more, more seriously, um I'm one of one of the viewers has asked whether there's a sense that people were writing knowing that their works would be read uh, aloud or read collectively or performed in the way that you demonstrated. Can we see traces in the written texts of an assumption of a kind of oral culture that's going on at this time? I think that's such an interesting question and probably a, there's a whole other book about that. I think that's exactly right. Um, I mean, I think we might think about the way in which the heroic couplet is used in 18th century poetry, which makes those little kind of aphoristic snippets very kind of takeable outable um, of a lot of the verse of the time. You don't have to remember the whole thing. You can just take a little bit out of it. But I think also thinking about 18th century fiction. So one of the things that I found really interesting when I looked at diary entries of people. Uh, so what I really loved was people who wrote diaries and just told you everything about their day because then they would tell you what they were reading, how many pages they read and who they read it with. And you can start to map a sense of that, the kind of social life of the book in a quite practical way. And one of the things that you realize when you start to look at those diary entries is that there's never the same group of people assembled for every book reading. So say you're reading something like Fanny Burney's Cecilia or Evelina, they're quite long novels. They're read over a series of weeks and because in the kind of boring but deep, brilliantly detailed type diaries, the, because the, the people assembled each time are different, you can really understand how epi uh, episodic fiction arises, that you have to have each scene as a kind of separate little vignette, so it makes sense in its own terms, because people are not going to be always knowing exactly what happened in the last chapter. So I think the kind of episodic structure of a lot of 18th century fiction lends itself to serialization, even when the book wasn't published in serial form. So even when it's published as a whole thing, it um, uh, would have been consumed in little chunks and therefore written structures in little chunks. It's fascinating. I mean, from my point of view, as someone who works on 19th century Russian literature, and we think of big, long novels, but in fact, they were consumed in a very similar way with a chapter a month, um, which explains why in a novel like Anna Karenina, one moment the plot's dealing with one group of people and the next moment, and that episodic structure is, is there. And we, we don't often feel that when we go and buy a big, thick book from mm. the book and sort of try and read it all in all in all in one go. So it's fascinating to see your 18th century work resonating in a in a slightly later period. Um, another question that's come in is about the relationship between this sort of 
written culture and the reading aloud of words already written and kind of oral folk culture and storytelling, which is perhaps more spontaneous or passed down um, without being mediated by, by the written form. Do you see a kind of interaction there between these, these two modes of, of producing stories and texts? Yeah, that's that's also a very interesting question. So I, so most of the work I've done has been on um, printed th this kind of print culture, which is around the aspirational sort of reading aloud and creating um, uh, compilations for middling sort audiences, which enable them to do a really fabulous job of entertaining their friends in the evening. But there's clearly running alongside that the strong the you know a kind of oral folk culture, which is about the passing down of a story which gets modified each time it's read out aloud and they coexist. And I think that we would want to think about different models of reading aloud. You know, there's a reading aloud in communities which aren't all literate where the person who has literacy enables something to become spoken or read for those who don't have access to it. And that it's very much a mixed model. I think one of the things that is interesting is the way oral, oral culture gets turned into print culture. So in those sort of jest riddle books that I was talking about, they are really about taking the snippets of oral life, of jokes in the pub or with your friends, bits of smart and packaging them up and selling them as part of a print culture. So it becomes harder to divide into a, into a world of, of kind of, pol of polite print, if you like, and, um, and a traditional oral folk culture. Great. I'm going to bring together two, two related uh, questions. One was, uh, how were the books selected that were read in these in these groups and in these domestic spaces? Is there any evidence of that process of selection? Um, and then a sort of more presentist one, which is, could you recommend something now that would be really good to read in the ways that you've been describing if people want to go and try this at home for themselves? Okay, so the first, so the first question is about how people chose the stuff. Well, I think, isn't it interesting that Dorothy Wordsworth's diary entry thing that she just pulls any random old thing off the shelf to read aloud in the pub. So the idea that it's a carefully curated event, uh, each reading aloud session is given the lie by that instance. I think that there will have been times where people just went for what they had. The fact that you could get compilations which gave you easily accessible and appropriate material for family consumption uh, was one way of kind of pre-selecting what that material was one of the things that I found, a really funny thing that I found was a collection of works called The Family Instructor. So it's a series of things which are suitable for reading out in your family on a Sunday after, you know, it's presented as good, clean fun. And the person who owned that book clearly didn't think it was all good, clean fun. And so they got some soap labels and stuck them down over the pages of a poem that they thought was too rude for the family to read. And that poem was about someone getting a ladle stuck up their bum. And they just clearly thought that <laughs> is not, not rude. Fam <laughs> that is not <laughs> just, family entertainment. It's just every day so I suppose the sense of where the nine o'clock watershed was in terms of appropriateness is a kind of question there about what people chose. And then in terms of what um, I think would be good, I can't think of anything in particular, but I think you want, if you're going to be reading something over a series of days or weeks, then you want something which has got a bit of an episodic structure, which has a, which is broken down into little chunks, as we discussed, so that you don't have to have too much catch up between each moment. Dialogue works really well, accents, uh, a kind of mixed tone, so that, I mean, that is what is good about many 18th century novels, that they shoot between kind of tragedy and comedy uh, description and dialogue, so that you get a kind of generic mix within, within an individual work. Actually, I'm thinking of that at the moment because we're teaching online and thinking of how not just to do the same old, but how to use the new format to even change what we're doing. And I'm very much thinking that actually some some drama would be a really good way, shorter, more episodic. And in my field, Chekhov captures that sort of tragic comic mixture, and that's so. I'm, I'll follow up on that and credit you for the for the for, for the for the for the inspiration. Um, a, a number of questions have come in which are really to do with with gender here, which. Uh, are there a diff is there a difference between the way men may read or women may read or mixed communities? Um, is there a difference in, in the kind of social function or the, the function in the family that people might perform dependent, uh, depending on whether they're, they're, they're men or women? Mm. Um, that's a good question. I mean, so clearly some of that rise of the novel anxiety about novels being uh, too erotically charged and seductive and dangerous for women or young people to be reading on their own. There's a gendered element to that because women are seen as not having enough 
kind of barriers to prevent them from being seduced by the fiction in front of them. So, so, so there's clearly a gendered element there. I think that in terms of, so there are some situations in which the same kind of reading to seems to happen on the same day of the week across many households and many decades. And that is that Sunday is a special day for devotional reading and the reading of scripture. And I think that would often have been carried out by the kind of patriarch of the house who had a responsibility for the spiritual guidance of everyone in the household, not just family, but the servants as well. So there's a kind of uh, gendered aspect to that. Um, then there's a the whole question of who has the literacy in the household that, you know, we can talk about households where you have a choice about who reads. And then there, have, there are households where there's no choice about who reads because not everyone can read. So a key part of the education of, of the kind of dissenting education of children was in enabling kids to learn so that they could read to their parents who didn't have literacy. And so in that case, you get the, the reverse of what we expect our generational model of reading allowed to be, which is that adults read to children to teach them. But in fact, in this case, it's children newly literate reading to the non-literate parents. So there are lots of different kinds of knowledge dynamics going on in that situation. Right. And interesting when you talk about sort of access to literacy and knowledge and the sort of uh, instances of, I suppose, power and authority. Uh, what about class and the sort of upstairs, downstairs dynamics or uh, are there instances of, of how what might be seen as potentially quite rigid boundaries between social castes and class are actually effaced by collective reading or shared, uh, the kind of shared performance reading uh, um, cultures that you've, you've mapped out for us? Yeah, I mean, there are some examples um, yeah, there are some, there are some, there's some anecdotal evidence of uh, people having their literate servants reading to them while they do other things. So in that case, that's a shared reading experience, but not, you know, one person is being employed to do the reading for mm -hmm. another person. Um, there's a really extraordinary anecdote about a group reading of Samuel Richardson's Clarissa, which, as many of you know, is the longest novel in the, 80, in, in the English language. And I guess there were two things that took a really long time in the 18th century. One was reading Clarissa and the other one was having your hair done with those enormous things. <laughs> and there's a description of a woman having her hair dressed with a group of female friends around her. So the maid behind her is doing her hair. All the women are listening to one of them reading out loud uh, from Clarissa. The woman having her hair done suddenly realizes she can feel some like plops of water landing on top of her head. And the maid who is doing her hair, listening to Clarissa, has started to cry at the pathos of the scene. So they all kind of stop. Um, the woman having the hair done goes outside with the maid. We're told that she goes outside of the room and she presses some coins into her hand as payment for her sensibility. So there the maid okay. is kind of rewarded for her refined feelings at having cried at this fictional um this fictional story in polite company and then gets to kind of in some way join the group of feeling that is normally outside of her kind of class remit. Mm -hmm. Because that's 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 really interesting it sounds like a story and it's a right that's, that's, that's <laughs> right, right for retelling. I wonder I mean you've you've talked about your Abby your academic interest in this and then clearly Charles you perform and you um, were you creating this kind of literary musical salons before you embarked on this project or as uh, you know or have you become very self-conscious about doing these things thinking about it in a historical context or does the, all that knowledge and learning fall away when you start reading uh, aloud and you start interacting and sewing I mean if you sew at the same time or playing uh, um, and what does your academic uh, engagement with this material do to your own experience of, of reading and sociability? I think um, well I mean I've always been interested in this this era of music anyway, so, and, and earlier music, which, which obviously always involves a certain amount of research, just because the further back you go, the less that's known about the way it's performed. So um, it's always been uh, interesting to, to see the context of, of how the music is placed. You know, we've, when I started out playing music, it was very much a fixed concert hall format. You know, everybody played concerts, you had a programme, you didn't really know what the music was. Uh, and, and during my career, I think more and more has is, is, is been done um, on imaginative programming and putting programmes in different places and contextualising the music. And it makes all the difference to the way that the music is played. I mean, really, I was playing some dance pieces there, but I don't know 
really many examples or if any where dance music was played without a dancer you know we, nowadays we think oh we could play a dance because it's a nice tune but i think you know it, it always had a social context where people would have actually um applied the function of dancing to it <laughs> so um you know so it's been very interesting from that point of view mm -hmm. actually chiming chiming in with that we've just had a question in asking people uh, asking whether broadsides and chat books were involved in these in these events as well as the kind of printed literary text that we've talked about yes well some of the broadsides appear in the these miscellanies um that we used in the home mm -hmm. don't they we've used um we've, we've used ballads from from the text of these miscellanies in this program um mm. and to go back to that question about how so the question was really about how this uh research has influenced our practice but in fact it's been for me it's the really big impact has been the other way around so doing kind of semi or public performances has really changed the way i've understood the material that actually doing it makes you think oh how it worked you know what I mean so we had this really well to me it was really striking we did a gig at your um, early music festival and we were singing a song in praise of Yom which was a kind of really kind of vanilla-ish pastoral celebration of the town of Yom uh, which used these sort of neoclassical ideas of green verdure and idyllic green and um, uh, you know calm and those kind of, there are so many of those poems in the 18th century and so many of those songs and I never really understood why they're so popular and so we're singing it in this or they're singing it in this church in York and had begun the piece by saying anyone here from Yom and there were a whole lot of people in the back going yeah Yom <laughs> and then during the song when they sang the line uh, the streets clean and spacious the verdure is the something houses are neat and the goddess Minerva has here her seat everyone laughed and it became kind of ironic because they were measuring up their own lived experience of Yom with this idealized version that was in the song. And I realized, oh yeah, of course, people enjoyed the mismatch between their lived reality and its idealization. And they saw that as a kind of funny, ironic thing rather than what I had thought, which is, oh my God, this is so trite and boring. Why does everyone want to read pastoral idealizations of the rural countryside? It was because, so they enjoyed the exploitation of that gap. And I would not have thought about it like that had we not you know, had we not performed it. Wow, fascinating. Um, uh, another question has just come in, uh, which asks about the relationship between reading aloud uh, and the kind of advice that you were talking about in the domestic space, which was a sort of about an, an artful form of naturalness, as opposed to what we might know about stage declamation and theatrical practices and the advice given to, to those who are working in those kind of public spaces. I mean, can, is, are there, is there a continuum or is there a discontinuity? Be, between the kind of very different practices that were going on in these different spaces. Yeah, I find that really interesting. So lots of the elocution books that appear to teach you how to do reading aloud at home say at the beginning, oh, it's just totally not like the theatre. You mustn't be too hammy and stagey. Mm -hmm. The home is a different kind of a space. But then the examples that are given are often taken from fa famous players of the era, like, oh, this is how Garrick did that bit of Hamlet. So it was definitely informed by stage practice, but also very distinctly separate from it. And I think some of the issues around not being too much like the theater were less to do with a kind of, don't be too actively in style than to do with the kind of perceived moral consequences of embodying a fictional role, role within the home. So towards the end of the 18th century, you get the rise of amateur dramatics. So people staging theatricals in their homes. And there was a huge opposition to that because it was seen as really inappropriate for women to act as somebody else and to forget about their kids and their domestic responsibilities and get too carried away with the idea of being actresses who often had dubious reputations. So I think some of the don't be too like the theatre was to do with don't be too like the whole world of the theatre and everything that speaks of, rather than don't get carried away with your hand gestures. Right. And interesting as well to put a, to the, another angle on this is thinking about the reading aloud you mentioned earlier, the patriarch reading the family Bible and the religious text. That's a form of reading which is about truth and, and not impersonating, but conveying something kind of unmediated. And it's interesting to think of the, this kind of reading um, precisely being about artifice and impersonation and taking yeah. you to very, very different areas. Um, one of the questions which is... 
Has anyone guessed the answer mm. to the riddle? Well, I'm, just, I'm saving up the riddle answers. Okay, just to, okay. <laughs> and we'll come on to those uh, as a teaser to the audience to make sure that they stay for the last few minutes of the, the conversation. But <laughs> I've had a glimpse of the suggestions and they are brilliant and inventive. So uh, I'm sharing those, but a little suspense there. Um, one question was about dressing up. Did Was this just something that took place in sort of ordinary time or was there a kind of staging and framing of the reading and the, the, the reading aloud by, by kind of marking it as special and different by, by changing clothing? Well, who knows? I mean, you know, we're talking about reading aloud as if it was all one thing, but there will have been many different kinds. You know, there will have just been one person reading to another in bed or there will have been you know, these rather more performative social occasions where people made it into a kind of parlor game or the devotional experience of a of a Sunday reading. I don't know, it's a really good question about the dressing up. I mean, I guess in the parlor game format, that's more likely to have happened, but I don't think that every time anyone got out a book, they especially went upstairs and put on a new outfit for it, or given that it's a single person reading a book which often they would inhabit a different you know a range of character roles it seems quite unlikely that you would have some mad swap shop thing where you run out of the door and put on a new outfit to be a different person that you're you know <laughs> yeah. whose voice you're doing so it sounds like a, a it sounds like a, a future phd project for someone to <laughs> yeah. think about some material culture yeah. there um I'm just looking over at the questions which I'm trying to collate in separate, in, in, in nice coherent groups. Uh, I think one of the things that might be nice to finish up on is a series of questions which are about the present moment and how we can use what we've been talking about to help us through this. Um, one is, question has come in, which was, um, how often did the social life of books extend beyond the family? Was it common for neighbors or community members to join in the reading together, either at home or in venues? And I. And I see that as a historical question, but also as a present question, because we are all with the, our, our households that we're allowed to be with, but that kinship group and family group and friendship groups, I think we're all missing those kind of relations. So I, I wonder whether you have any historical evidence about, about yeah. how the reading uh, groups were extended beyond the immediate uh, households. Yeah, so that's something that really emerged from those kinds of detailed diary entries that I talked about, where people say, oh, Mrs. Overton was there, and so was Miss Sugden, when they talk about the changing cluster around their, what is essentially a family group, because of this whole practice of visiting on a daily basis, you know, you get like four different sets of people coming to see you, and the reading aloud will be part of that, but you don't know that the reading will happen with the same group of people who were there yesterday. So I think there was probably kind of you know, extended family in a rather more fluid sense, a, a kind of penumbra of other acquaintances who will have been part of those occasions. Um, I think you can also, I was just thinking about that, translating that into kind of contemporary moment where we're doing everything, you know, so many things virtually so that we see people, but we're not actually seeing them. We're seeing them through a screen or on a phone. And one of the um, ways in which books link people together and create social bonds is through the way in which people discuss them over letters in the 18th century. So you will get groups of friends who are discussing in an exchange between them what they make of the thing that they've all recently read together. So they have a kind of virtual book club which is conducted um, through the post and that seems a very kind of parallel thing and they often talk about longing to see one another, being stuck in a house in the country, not being able to get out, but this being um, uh, an alternative or a replacement for the kind of, what, the, the kind of physical sociability that they long for. Uh -huh. One of the things that's really interesting about these live events is the way that as we're talking, questions are coming in. You're anticipating in your answers the questions that come in and someone has just asked about academic uh, uh, writing groups and book groups and the way we share our views and the, the way that what you're describing looks like a very modern phenomenon as we share our views of uh, a book that we're reading mm. as, as and when we're doing it, waiting for the, the next example. Uh, but a really curious question has come in that set me thinking, um, we've had a lot about words, a lot about language, a lot about music. And we, we have, we've had a sort of noise-led session, but what about silence in all of this? And this comes from a questioner who's uh, asked about these kind of Zoom meetings for meditation where people tune in and share silence with each other. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that phenomenon. And uh, how, what do you think about the relationship between noise, voice, music making, sound, and then silence? Yeah. I think, um, yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we have replaced a whole story about silent reading in what, what we've been saying today 
with one about noisy, busy reading. Um, and that is a kind of counter argument to the idea of the rise of the silent reader and that it's a form of self absorption. And but in doing so, we have cut out that history of quietness in reading that uh, is a key part of the way in which many people experienced reading together. I think um, just looking at the kind of historical evidence of discussion of silence and noise, there were examples that I found in diaries and letters that I read where people talked about the kind of bullishness of reading aloud in social spaces that they would go into a room and someone would insist on reading the paper out loud even when they just wanted to sit down quietly and write a letter or read their own book so I think you know sometimes that noise can be invasive especially when you've got a whole lot of people in a house and, and a limited number of social spaces to be in it's not always this kind of Pollyannaishly lovely binding bonding experience, yeah. creating joint noise and reading in a house. Sometimes it's alienating and pretty much pretty irritating to have somebody else's literary tastes or elocutionary aspirations foisted upon you. Well, there's been certainly nothing alienating or irritating about our discussion for the last hour. Um, but before I thank you and wrap up, um, I've got one last question and then we'll go to the suggestions that the viewers have given about the riddle. One person wants to know what's the name of the riddle book? Because clearly the sales of this are going to be very, very, very oh, high. Yeah. Good point, actually. Um, it is called, and um, it's either called The Theatre of Wit or The Muse in Masquerade. Uh huh. Um, I can't remember which one it's from. There's so many of them. That you've, there are uh, so many of them. They are ten of many of those riddle books. Yeah. Well, uh, this is one for the Torch team. We'll find out the title and we'll put it on our Twitter feed afterwards uh, in case people want to track it down. But it sounds like there are several of these. But I let me. Yeah, some of the... Sorry, I think it might be available on Google Books, so we might be able to uh -huh. sort out a link to a PDF. But yeah. Great, we'll, we all crack on with that. But I just want to share with you the inventive suggestions from our imaginative uh, viewers. So someone has suggested it might be a purse. Someone has gone with a needle. Someone has gone for a pocket that is tied around the waist and not sewn in the pocket. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Someone else has suggested a book on a lap. Someone has um, suggested a chair. Someone has suggested a toilet. And someone has gone for a cello. And uh, I'll leave you. <laughs> yeah. I, the well, there cello is puts me in mind yeah. of an absolutely um, unprintable uh, Thomas Beecham story, but other people will have to track <laughs> I know. But, uh, uh, yes, those of us who know it can uh, enjoy some uh, 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 silent pleasure from that one. But I think we should ask you to reveal the punchline now. Ah, the answer is a rolling pin. Oh. Excellent. Well, you know, for all those home bakers who've discovered um, the pleasure <laughs> of long hours in the kitchen during the lockdown, that's one for you. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Giles. That's just been a terrific uh, uh, trip to the 18th century and a whole series of wonderful parallels with our own time. Thank you for your energy and your insights and all your answers to the questions. Thank you to, to all the viewers at home for watching and for joining in. Uh, with the intellectual discovery and also the delight of this session. So please join us next week for Big Tent live event. This will take place on Thursday the 7th of May at 5 p.m. Next week I will be in conversation with Dr. Leah Broad and we'll, together we'll be celebrating Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, Russia's most famous 19th century composer, and that will form part of our music week. We hope that you'll be able to join us again then. Thank you for joining us today and goodbye.